So I'm going to look at creating connections. So we've kind of we've looked at the individual. Now, like you spoke about in there, Stu, just kind of trying to link it in a little bit. So over to you again, Paul. How important are play connections and relationships when creating the attack? And what do coaches need to be looking for on and away from the ball? Um, well, really clearly, the, the, the pass is has to give the, the, the receiver the best options, possible options. So is it playing the ball in front? Is it the right weight? Is it quick through a gap? Um, does it set them up to do the next thing? So it's no use a pass that's bobbling, pass that's spinning if it doesn't have to, um, a pass that's coming too fast. We want a pass that allows them to receive it and do exactly what they want. Now, the other thing in terms of connections is they have to be on the same wavelength. So uh, one of the key things here, which we may talk about individuals, but this is where the team thing does come in, that you have to get the correct position. So if you want to create the right space, you do have to spread out as a team. You do have to get between the lines and get in good positions. Um, so that's vital to give, to make, create bigger gaps between the opposition. So, you know, your starting position is important. But then for me, the, the receiver has to give a clear signal. And that starts with their positional play. Are they blindside of their, their man? Are they uh, on the outside? Are they stood in front, pinning him and stopping, stopping him getting to the ball? Um, you know, what's the, the sort of position that when he looks up, the passer, before he gets the ball, he's already got an idea what could happen. And then it might be a clear signal, which might be eye contact. It might be definitely speed, you know, to come off quickly for the ball at the last second. One of the common faults you get with, with young players is the ball's already, say, going to the fullback and the midfield player runs over too soon, brings his defender with him. They've got to stay away and then at the last second go towards the ball. Um, so those would be key connections. Um, the, the, the sort of picture you create positionally, then the speed of connection and then the body movement. Are, you know, are you coming off side on? Are you opening up to spin behind? All would be giving a real um, picture to the, um, to the passer, yeah. And I, I think it's really important, and I have a big thing on this, is I always say good passers need good runners. So when we're creating the attack, it, there's a big thing of, you know, we're passing it, we're moving. But I think at times, if you, when you can create an attack, I think on the on the actual video, it showed Mane was coming short and he's spanning behind and they got in one pass. So I, for me, if you if you get runners in behind, it stretches defence. If you can do it in one, and we spoke about penetration, that's just as effective as having 10 passes to get through the middle. There's different ways. So I think, you know, you get some of the top players and some of the top passers, but the top passers need good good runners. And running and being penetrating back lines and running in behind is a very effective way of doing it. Uh, any thoughts, Stu? Yeah, no, I think you're right, Fudge. I think, and hopefully we'll see plenty of that on Sunday when we got uh, maybe Kane dropping in and obviously two wide players really really penetrating the back line off the back of it. And, you know, it, it, it is key, isn't it, to try and stretch the back line, to try and free up spaces, whether that's, you know, certainly in midfield area, depending on what the back line do, but also certainly in wide spaces as well. You know, is it the wide players hugging the touchline or is it them coming in as inverted wide players and the fullbacks trying to get into that wide space? You know, if you can't go over and you can't go through, then we want to try and go around them. So the occupying space is for um, either yourself to receive it or for other players within the team to receive it is key. And I suppose it's 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 really recognising um, and going back to your players, recognising their capabilities. So if we maybe work at the younger end, and we haven't got players who can run past the ball over bigger distances, then creating the attack is going to look very different. If you're working maybe at an older age where you've got players who can play a bit more expansively and you've got energy to maybe stretch and, and you know run off the back line, then you might be able to go and create the attack in different ways. So it's it's recognising what your players are able to do at this moment in time um, and then start to really think about what create the attack looks for you in your environment and give the, the right diet of of sessions and practices and information to try and help your players make sense of it. Uh, there's one on the chat box here about one-twos and getting in line and around the corners, Paul. Does that link to what was on the webinar? I think the Liverpool one where it's passing to Robertson, he moves the ball offline inside, changes the picture. And, and I think that what's going on away from the ball there is so important because the man on the ball is changing the picture, but everyone else is reacting to it. 
Yeah, I think uh, it's really important to think about um, the man on the ball. Graham Carrick talks about this. The man on the ball is in charge of the game. So quite often, you know, against a good defence, the picture won't be right. You know, you, you've not got the right picture. So by moving with the ball, you know, or running with the ball or taking the ball, um, you know, when holding it for a certain amount of time, the picture will change. If you hold the ball at the back, Johnny Evans does this well, and people like Ramos, they hold the ball at the back, and just wait for the opposition to move. They come towards them. Now and now a gap's appeared behind the person who's pressing them. So the, the picture will change. It's a dynamic game. It's it's about our interaction. So if you move, the, the, the picture will move and the defenders will move. And now it might create a new opening. So the, the player on the ball is in charge of the game. They can manipulate the position. So um, again, Michael Carrick talking uh, on, on here a year ago, saying, "Well, he's in midfield. He's got the he's got the right back free. Well, he's not going to give it him straight away because that's not the best pass. He, the best pass is sort of opening up, might be round the corner, like you've just said. So he's going to have that there, that and shape his body as if he might play to the right back. He'll keep running with it, and as the player, his marker comes towards him. Now he played quickly around the corner, maybe get a one-two, and he's delayed that and and, and created a new picture." Um, by knowing he's, oh, I've got the fullback there, but why would he just pass to the fullback? You know, he's he's waiting for a better picture to uh, to appear, and I think that is a common fault. You know, in, in in a lot of play, we say move the ball, move the ball quickly, keep moving it. Yeah, but sometimes you have to hold it as the passer. Um, you know, to create the best picture. I had a player once, well, some really good players, but I had a good left footer used to come across the pitch, come across the pitch, looking, looking in the midfield. And people are saying, play it off quick, play one touch. He's holding it too long. He's holding it and he's looking, looking for that little gap, waiting. And then he'd look at the winger. He'd keep coming. He'd look at the full back. He'd look at the winger again, raise his foot as if he's playing to the winger. And now the, the full back reads it, starts to go towards the winger. And then he'd reverse the pass inside the full back at the last moment. So those sort of skills, by staying on the ball, creating a new picture, um, that's something I think you know is a common fault with coaches as well. That they don't let the players explore that type of thing to look for the best penetrative pass. It's a great point, Paul. And I think you know we talked around coaches understanding the players and their capabilities. It's getting in relationships from the players to understand what their fellow players can do as well, isn't it? Because you can read the touch. You know it. You know what to expect from the players when they take a certain touch into a certain space, and how we then adjust our position to try and support that player. And I suppose it goes back to the point around varying the ball speed, what you said before. You know, there's a message on the ball, isn't there? So if I want to try and bring someone towards me, then I might hit it a little bit softer to try and attract him towards, to try and create a little bit of space and developing combination plays and then connections. So, yeah. No, exactly. I mean, that point there, you've just just mentioned, um, Gareth Southgate said, has said uh, one of the biggest things he's, the Man City players have said to him, they've learned from Guardiola, is to understand the weight of pass and the, uh, the pass that sets back instead of turning because the player who's who's facing the play can now see all the options ahead. So it's like the flow of communication is that bit quicker. So they do it a lot of City, say Aguero comes off, they play a ball into his feet. Now, in, if he turned... He might be able to now turn, look up, play the pass. But because he comes off and he lays it with the right weight of pass for a first-time pass, left, you know, he leaves it playable for a first-time pass, the midfield player sees all the picture earlier and the wide men can run off that timing of that pass. So, you know, if you know what you're doing, a setting up pass like that can be just as effective as turning, yeah, or even more effective. There's some there's some good points in the chat box. There's some things about communication when it's it's good that communication is not always verbal. Some of the top players you've got to think when there's like 100,000 in a stadium, it's sometimes a bit of eye contact. You know, the best passers with strikers, their communication. I think of back when Leicester won the league, uh, Drinkwater and Vardy. You know, that wasn't verbal. That was probably something they worked on in training, a bit of eye contact. There's loads of different ways that these top players can connect. So I think that's important to get out. Also, a couple around Grealish. If he was Portuguese or potentially Spanish, um, would he play more central midfield role? Would he have a free role? I know Pirlo from Italy. I think he started as a number 10 in his younger days. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts around that, Stu? 
Yeah, I think we we just don't know, do we? I think that's the main thought. So we, we, we make assumptions sometimes on players too quickly and we actually don't know where they might actually end up. Um, more often than not, the attacking players, you know, if they're, if they're not that elite, they'll start to gravitate back to the kind of the, the midfield or defensive position. So it's just about giving players as much variety and volume of, of different experiences as possible. And, you know, I think we're going to come on to design a practice, but, you know, I'm... I'm I'm pretty much simple in me thinking that it's just games. I mean, games are the best practice, whether that's a 1v1 game or a 11v11 game. So, and everything will come up out of that because you've got as much realism as you can probably get with the numbers you've got available to you. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, it's just recognising that people are different. And obviously, when we get to the team element after, we'll start discussing style of play and systems of play. Then, you know, you will have to have certain individuals to try and excel in certain certain systems but yeah it's it's just great to understand that people are different and give them lots of different experiences up through the pathway I think yeah. Butch as well is the really good point before about communication so there's you can make communication with your body language with the weight of your pass uh, with just leaving a soft pass so he knows he's coming off quick it can be like you say eye contact it can be body movement quickly so if I think um, if you remember on that clip uh, Mane He's really looking disinterested. So I think this is a key thing as well. When we're talking about communication, there has to be hiding your intentions, disguising your intentions, hiding that communication. So you're both on that wavelength, but you don't want to let the defender know. So a lot of kids' common mistakes is that, yes, give me the ball, run down the channel. They'll they'll make their in, intentions really clear, whereas really at the top level, they're hiding them. They're not running too much. They're going from naught to 60 in three seconds, bang, and, and the change of speed, but then the body language. So I think in that in that clip we showed, Mane was just sort of just in eye, eye line with the defender, but he was pretty square on, half, half turned, and not really looking interested. But as soon as Robertson got the ball, bang, now he went chest forward, ran behind, and that was the signal. So definitely disguising your intentions – or looking as though you're switched off to switch the defender off and then quickly coming to, to life is a big skill for people losing their marker. And then, of course, disguise on the ball is maybe that one we talked about with Carrick or, or, or my left footer from before. It makes it look like he's going to pass to the fullback and disguise then is small, late movements. So it looks all his body language says it's going to be a side foot pass to the fullback and the very last second, bang, he turns it inside with the inside of his foot. So disguise would be another key thing here in terms of communication, disguising your communication, yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's true. So we've spoke about all different skills that players, like, you know, that they'd require. So how do coaches go about developing these skills within practice? And we're talking about creating connections. Yeah, I think I've kind of touched upon it before around me being quite simple in my thinking and... You know, more often than not, the observations I get when I'm working with, in the field with coaches is sometimes design a practice is something what they really struggle on and they really fight with the actual practice and maybe um, manage the practice rather than coaching the players. So going back to Paul's point around, you know, recognising what you want to see and how you can observe that uh, within the practice. I think if you've got a game, what you're running, whether it's a 1v1 or way through to 11v11, depends what format you're looking towards. I think it's as simple as that. It's got direction, it's rectangular, it's got goals at either end, whether that's a, you know, two goals or a line or zones or whatever it might be. But it's attack versus defence. And within then kind of practices what you have and the game being the best practice, you've got all these uh, problems what the opposition might pose you. So you've got to then start thinking about how I'm going to provide a solution for that problem. So whether it is me versus you and I think I'm quick and I'm just going to try and beat you with sheer pace, Great, it might work for the first time, but then you might provide a different problem to that solution I've got. So then you have to come up with a different way of maybe thinking about beating, which might have to come in inside and maybe combine if we're playing a 2v2 or a 3v3, etc. So I think the, the simplistic nature of practice is how many is keep it game-based and you can play with numbers, whether it's unopposed, opposed, uh, underloaded, over, whatever it might be. But if it's directional, it's got some kind of opposition and ways of scoring, it might seem really simple, but the pictures become really clear. And if the pictures are clear, certainly to the players, but also certainly to ourselves as coaches, we can then offer possibly the right information at the right time. 
to try and help the players we've got working with, whether that's down at the foundation phase or even through to first team. It's just recognising where we go in and how we support and understand that if we are going to get players who can think and make decisions in the hardest moments of the game, then we need to try and think about how we can replicate that within our training weeks. Because I don't think kids are playing enough games of football. So that's what we've got to try and recreate all the time with our sessions. Yeah, and, and I think I, I definitely agree with that. Is And I think you've got to give young players the, oppor- the opportunities for them to practice where they almost develop their toolbox so they can understand what's their key strengths, what's their super strength maybe, yeah. and they can kind of quickly identify who they're playing against and what's their opponent's potential weakness. So how do they then use their strength against their opponent's weakness to get the better of that duel? And I think that becomes really important. And I think the only way you can do that is, is giving them and putting them in positions and give them the experience to go and practice it and figure it out themselves at times. So when they do get higher up, when they still go and start going through the phases, they start realising, well, actually, I, I quickly identify what my opponent's not good at. I know what I'm good at, so I can get the better of them in them 1v1 duels. And I think that's really important. Yeah, and I think as well, Futch, with that, sorry to just cut across, but um, it's really making sure that we, get, we afford them enough space so we yeah. don't go too small. So even though we are talking about creating the attack, and wanting to look at scanning, receiving, playing. Sometimes we tend to go into small areas because it looks a bit quicker and looks a bit sharper and it looks really good. But actually, we, we need to give players spaces where they can really um, make really good decisions. So, for example, if it's <coughs> the attack, and we mentioned before about penetration, it might be the ball in behind, which is our first thought. So if it's on, we need to play it, but then we need to understand the connections between um, the pass and receiver to try and occupy that space. Uh, so, yeah, I think we just got to make sure we, we, we're not always on small pitches. We, we you know, we, we have a variety of, of shapes and sizes of pitches to try and make it as real as we can. And I think that's really important. It's uh, trying at times. I know it's difficult sometimes with space, but giving players the, the space to run into and pass into. So if we always work in small areas, then we come on to, to a game on a Saturday or a Sunday, then we're moaning that players haven't got the capability to hit longer passes or they don't run forward. Well, actually, do we ever practice it? And yeah. I think that's a really key, a really key point. Paul, um, there's quite a few things coming in now about under the microscope. So on the on the webinar, you spoke about um, the real detail of what under the microscope can look like. Can you link some of the skills that we spoke about into into that observational to, tool that you've kind of created? Um, yeah, a little bit. Before I do that, I just sort of underlining. What Stuart's just said about, you know, we're talking about session design design and all that, but I think even sort of more underpinning that is the culture that you create when when you start your your training. So um, the FA have a really good course, the AYA course, the Advanced Youth Award, um, generally for academies and uh, and stuff, but it's very good. There's a guy called Murph Roberts on it. He does social, he does the social block, talking about teams and social everything to do with the social side of football. And he talks about social construction. How do you set standards and boundaries and so on? And and he also, um, attachment theory, where, where you, you're talking about the, the trust involved between a, a coach and, and, and the players and so on. And it's, it's really very good. But I think we need to emphasise this even more in terms of the football, because the social side of football, we just talked about it, connections, communication and, and standards. So if we want all these things to come out, then we have to set a standard. So, you know, we can practice five, 10 yard passes and get them really smooth and really, really good and get their first touch. So then we have to insist on that standard all the time in the training because that's basically, in terms of football, that's like that's like walking or, 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 or it's like brushing your teeth. If you don't brush your teeth very well, you're going to fall out. If you, if you don't pass the ball well over 10 yards, you're going to lose the ball all the time. So that has to be not just like a, that has to be just what you do, the pride in, in your identity that you do these things well, a good side foot pass, a good quality of pass, the right weight to the right side, to the right place. And um, the same thing with, um, with receiving the ball, protecting it, shielding it, turning one way or the other. Um, so these standards, they, they are, they're like, the base level we've got to set that standard and then make sure that's what happens every every training session no matter really whether it's grassroots a lot you're going to enjoy the game a lot better if you stick to these sort of standards and and in terms of well what, how do they learn well if they trust the coach he's not going to have a go at them and he's going to trust that he's going to back them and um 
then they're more likely to try some of the things we're talking about. So that the chances to improve, you know, each time they come, they're going to be looking forward to it, to trying things. And then it's, um, you create um, basically learning power. We, we, we try to learn every time we come. So the whole like, aspect of that social construction um, is vital. And then in effect, what you're talking about, the quadrant is just a way for us to view that. It's all that is, is can we zoom in and put it under the microscope and see, well, do they drag and dodge? Do they do they turn and put their body between the ball? You know, do they entice people close and then play a one-two? What exactly do they do? Do they play a nice smooth pass? Do they get eye contact? Are they scanning, you know? Uh, is the player getting blindsided of their opponent before they come? So it's just a way to sort of say these are what we would call uh, slowly you build them up, these capabilities. So at first, like Stu said, foundation phase, can they just manipulate the ball, stay on it? But then you might be saying, well, can you get your head up while you're staying on it and stay on it for the right amount of time to find a pass? Now, if that pass is good, the next guy, he's got to, can he look before the ball comes? Because if he controls it and then looks, it can be too late. So there's all these little steps yeah. that, you know, that under the microscope helps you put that, put put it right under the microscope and says, are they doing that? Are they looking at, let me look at the head for a bit. Or let me look at the feet for a bit. That's the whole thing. And then you might say, well, we're going to work on this for six weeks. Six weeks we're going to work on this because I think they're all going to benefit. It's uh, an analysis tool and then a coaching tool for you, yeah. And I think I think it's a great point, Paul. You make, and you know, when the when the practice design is simple, it allows the coach then to observe, doesn't it, to make sure the players are actually getting what they need. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. And I think then it's clear sometimes they need more space and more time to try these new things out. They're thinking in action, so you need to give them time. If it's eleven aside all over, they can't see the wood for the trees. Yeah. So maybe we playing in three aside, four aside first. Now they get the habit of it. Oh, we'll make it six aside. Well, he's, he's still getting those same things. Well, let's go back to three aside. If they're not, then we'll go back up to six aside. Um, so we're giving them more space and time and giving them more clarity then maybe for what they need to do. And then we need to praise them when they do it well or give them a little correction, you know, because uh, it's clearer for us as coaches then as well to see. Yeah, and it's just the three R's, is it? It's a relevance, repetition and realism. Just recognising what you might trade off with whatever practice you put on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. I think it's a long-term development plan for the players. Like when we talk about under the microscope, all the key factors, that's not going to fall into place overnight. That might be number of years' work over for a certain player. So it's important we don't see it and think, right, we've got to get all this out in one session. You know, you're scanning, your deception... Uh, these sort of things that it takes time to develop and it might take a certain player years to get, but but that's kind of the, the each individual and, and that's the kind of development plan that it needs to look like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it might just be one thing. So you might, there's one you can use. Any age group's quite good. is because deception, like I said before, is making it look like you're doing one thing, but at the very last second, changing it to something else. So if, if I'm passing a ball to Stuart, he passes it over, we all pass it round in a, 10 yards in a... And I, I make exactly the same action three or four times. I'm going to play a side foot pass to you, Stu. You play it back. I do it again. I do it again. And then I do it. But at the last second, I put my foot on top of the ball. It looks like I'm going to play it to you, but I put my foot on it and now I might drag it away. So that's a good game to play that you can use. This, you ask them to use the sole of their foot at any time. Now, if I'm in possession, I can make it look like I'm passing to Fudge, but at the last second, put my foot on it and drag it away. Little drag back, you know, um, Puskas, 1953. That's for the old guys. But, um, you know, just a little drag back. Or it could even be I'm running down the line. I put my foot on the ball and change direction. It looks like I'm going to shoot or cross it, but I just put my foot on, change direction. So that's a great way using the sole of your foot is really good for disguise, for practice that idea of disguise, that it look look at the guy look like you're going to pass it, same body language, and then the last second stop, drag it away. 